No, I am not Chris Mino. I'm the good looking officer in uniform today. <laughs> Privilege to introduce my friend, fellow warrior. Watch out, Christian, you come up here. This is a, oh, here we go. All right. Folks, my name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Coombs, U.S. Air Force, retired. Woo! If I happen to pass out during this introduction, don't worry. It's not a medical situation. The last full breath I took was 30 minutes ago when I put this jacket on. <laughs> You've got to be props. It's been 13 years since retirement, huh? So how how we look at it? At times, I wish this was a Baptist church because in this uniform jacket, I can only raise my hands this far. <laughs> Hard to do in a Pentecostal, full gospel church and a live church like this today. Yeah. Let me just state that it's Peter, our dear pastor's heart, that we have Chris Mino here to enlarge in our understanding and appreciation and allow you to pray better for the military families. Yes. Amen. Amen. Who was here last year and, and, and heard Chris and Laura? Amazing testimony. Put yourself in my shoes. You just graduated from college. You've got, uh, you're 22 years old. You have a wedding coming up in four months. You're down in Phoenix waiting for pilot training to start in about eight months. That's pilot training for the world's most lethal and effective air fighting force ever in human history. Yes. And a buddy says, hey, have you heard of this Colonel Chris Mino? No. He goes, oh, he's this guy that uh, ejected out of a supersonic jet fighter survived and through that experience God called him to Christ and he bowed his knee at the cross and came back. Now he's evangelizing for Christ. And I said, where is he? I've got to meet him. That started about a 28 to 30 year uh, friendship, really a brotherhood. Starting in Phoenix, moved to Southern California, over to Germany, to England finally down to Saudi Arabia, then to Boston, now Tulsa, and here in Seattle. So uh, it's with great honor that I introduce my friend. And as way of credibility, if you didn't hear his testimony last year, 30-year career spanning, starting in Vietnam, spanning through the Gulf War, where he assisted our, our wing in fighting uh, in that conflict. He has a doctorate or theology degree from Gordon Conwell, college in Boston. He's ministered throughout the world from Korea through Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. He and his uh, lovely wife have been dear friends. Uh, in fact, their younger son, who was just promoted to Brigadier General last month, was 13 years old when Amy and I was bab were babysitting he and his, his younger sister. So we've got that on us as well. So please, uh, really wholeheartedly welcome my friend, my mentor, my fellow airman for Christ, brother in the Lord, my superior officer, Colonel Chris Mino. What a blessing it is. We're all fired up this morning with wonderful praise and worship. Uh, you, it just doesn't get any better than this, brothers and sisters. And I do thank you for letting an old uh, warrior like me get in that uniform on this occasion and uh, just to be with you to celebrate the goodness of God. Uh, thank you for uh, Pastor Van Breda, Breda and uh, Peter and Gabby uh, letting me have this pulpit for this uh, short time. Tomorrow, November 11th, will be the 100th uh, recognition of what we call Veterans Day. It actually began in 1919, one year after World War I, to honor the veterans of that war. And since then, uh, we've honored the 43 million men and women that have served in our armed forces from the time of the revolution until today. And there's 43, uh, 23 million of them who are still alive today including Matt and I, if you can believe it, even though we don't look uh, like we should be. But, uh, but the, all of that, you know, since the founding of our nation 243 years ago, and it's just to remind us of their sacrifice, their courage, their dedication, and as Gabi so eloquently said, uh, that's why we have the freedom to live in this most blessed land, and not just about the prosperity, but about the absolutely guaranteed by our Constitution, our first liberty is religious freedom. And oh, I'll get into that in a moment. But uh, 
again, it, it's so important to remember the veterans who made this possible for us. And uh, they, they endured some horrible times from the winters at Valley Forge with all of the frostbitten and everything, the battlefields of Gettysburg, the trenches of uh, France in the, in the First World War. The, we just recognized uh, Normandy, uh, the unbelievable cost of lives to take that territory and liberate Europe, uh, the frozen hills of Korea, the jungles of Vietnam, uh, to the deserts of uh, Iraq and uh, the mountains of Afghanistan where they are even today. And uh, being one of those uh, 43 million, I got to share yesterday uh, with uh, a number of you uh, my own experiences, but I, I just want to start with one memorable event uh, early in my career as I graduated from pilot training, reported for combat crew training in the F-4. As I shared last night, they, as soon as we arrived, and this was September of 1965, uh, yes, Orville and Wilbur were still alive in those days. But, uh, uh, the, they called for a mass briefing in, in the base theater, as they would say in the South, and as we young pup, uh, fighter pilots-to-be uh, sat in our seats, uh, in walked this magnificent specimen of a colonel, shoulders this wide and, and a waist this narrow, uh, much uh, more physique than Matt and I. Uh, he was Chappie James, who went on to be a legend in the Air Force, the first black four-star general in all the military. And Chappie stood up there and he says, boys, there's a war going on in a place called Vietnam, and you is all volunteers. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, there's a war going on as we heard from the scriptures. Spiritual war, it's been going on for thousands of years. And I believe it is more intense than ever. And we are all in it. We're all volunteers. When you raise your hands to Jesus, you got commissioned in the army of the Lord. The American fighting man's code of conduct is, I am an American fighting man. I serve in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. I will never forget that I am an American fighting man, responsible for my actions and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. Well, I'm here today to uh, give you the Christian code of conduct. I am a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. I serve in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ, the host of heaven. I am called to overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony, and I will not love my life even unto the death. I will never forget that I am a Christian, responsible for my actions and dedicated to the principles that set me free from the law of sin and death. Do I hear an amen? amen. I, I will trust in my God, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his soon coming kingdom. Amen. That's our commission. Now, I got to tell you, uh, the first uh, of the actual secular oath of uh, American Fighting Man's Code of Conduct which says, I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. As uh, some of you know my testimony, I trusted mostly in myself. Uh, through combat, without a scratch on me and my airplane. So I knew it was because I was the world's greatest fighter pilot. And then three years later, just uh, in a very routine air combat training mission over the skies of England, uh, my airplane uh, experienced a catastrophic flight control failure pitched straight down, had about 10 seconds in which to make up my mind what to do. And there is a saying, when in doubt, punch out. Uh, there was a lot of doubt. I couldn't get the airplane to respond. We're going by this time supersonic, 750 miles an hour. I screamed to my back seater, punch out, Mike, and I pulled the handles. He went immediately, but my canopy, by this time at the supersonic speed, would not come off. I pulled again and again on the ejection handles in the, in the seconds that were passing, and nothing was working. And I screamed, 
please God to a God that I've been literally thumbing my nose at. But I'm here to tell you, it shall come to pass in the last days, and those were my last moments, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm a living testimony of the miraculous power of God, because when I scream, please God, that canopy miraculously exploded, and I exploded with that rocket seat into the air at 750 miles an hour. Both arms and legs were instantly broken before the parachute even opened. And the chute opened, I opened my eyes, the airplane's exploding beneath me, and I'm a limp rag doll smashing into the ground like a human pretzel. That doesn't sound like very much of a miracle, but I'm telling you it was. And I knew it. I knew that the last moment, the second I had screamed, please God. So it only took six years to put this body back together again. But the most important part that was put together again, as I've shared before, was when an Air Force chaplain, freshly filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit, he was a Methodist, hallelujah, but he was full of the power of God, came to my hospital bed, and he had me captive, solid plaster from head to foot. They said, you'll never fly again. I was broken inside and out. But it only took that man, I swear, only 30 seconds, maybe it was three to five minutes, suddenly he had me at the foot of the cross, and I had a vision of Jesus looking at me from the cross saying, I did this for you. Oh, the instant relief to know that my sins were paid for. Oh, I'd heard that for many times, but for it to become an absolute reality, only God can do that. And that began a transformation. That's still a work in progress, if I may say so myself. But uh, the this was 1969, and uh, the following year, on the 4th of July, as I've shared before, I made a declaration of dependence, surrendering totally to the Lord Jesus Christ, not only receiving his salvation from the cross, but dedicating my life to Jesus. The toughest thing for a military man is to surrender. You don't want to surrender. But isn't it interesting that the universal sign of surrender is also the universal sign of worship? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> but I want to get uh, to the heart of what is on my heart, which I believe is from the Lord this morning. Uh, we heard the scriptures uh, that we are, we are in a battle, not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against the rulers and authorities, and against the spiritual wickedness in heavenly realms. There's a war going on for the heart and soul for our nation. And Satan is doing everything he can to destroy this nation. But why? And I believe absolutely that America was raised up by God with a divine calling. America is exceptional because right from the start, right from its founding, it was dedicated to God. Christopher Columbus, when he set foot on the shores of the New World, he prayed, Holy Savior, O Lord God Almighty, everlasting God, by thy holy word, thou hast created the heavens, the earth, and the sea. Blessed and glorified by thy name, and praised by thy majesty, which has designed us to use us, thy humble servants, and here's the punchline, that thy holy name may be proclaimed in the second part of the earth. And he named that island San Salvador, the Holy Savior. Columbus knew this was God's destiny for this land, for this for would become our nation. Our nation actually traces its roots. By the way, if you go to the Capitol building in the Great Rotunda, there's seven paintings. The first one is Columbus landing and proclaiming this prayer. The next one is the Mayflower. As the pilgrims landed in Plymouth, they formed in 1620 the Mayflower Compact. And we recognize this was the first written framework of government being established in America. Why? It reads, having undertaken for the glory of God 
and the advancement of the Christian faith. That's the opening line of this Magna Carta. Isn't that fantastic? We thereby covenant and combine ourselves together in a civil body politic. The purpose of our government arrangement is to advance the Christian faith right from the get-go. That was our mission. That was our commission. And you know, there's only one other nation that holds this distinction of being founded and formed by scripture-believing peoples, and that is Israel. Israel, the apple of God's eye. By the way, if you poke Israel, you are poking God's eye, and God doesn't like it. He tends to get aroused like anybody. So why is America so prosperous, so influential the, the, in, in all of world history? Because I believe we have two mandates from God. One is to bring the gospel to the nations. Now, other nations are doing that, but no other nation has done more to bring the gospel to the nations in time, energy, talent, people, resources, monies, than America. And secondly, our mission is to bless the nation, the children of Abraham, and the nation of Israel. Yeah. And by the way, uh, bringing the gospel to the nations is not just by cemetery, seminary graduates, okay. Did you get that? No, you didn't. A little slow today. Uh, some people think it's cemetery. No, it's seminary where you get that fancy degree. But you don't need that to go to the nations. You just need the love of Jesus in your heart. You need to be sent. That's what missio means in Latin, to be sent. And guess who gets sent all over the world, courtesy of your tax dollars? The U.S. military. And I'm here to tell you that the military over the years and all of those conflicts has done an exceptional job of those who are Christians being salt and light in the military to help bring the gospel to the nations. Uh, Matt and I both served in Korea, not the war, but we served in the peacekeeping forces in, in South Korea. And it is a jewel of democracy, uh, a nation that couldn't even produce a, a, an electric fan uh, 40 years ago, now is producing computers and iPhones and cars. And, uh, but it's not just the physical uh, 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 blessings of, of, uh, of South Korea, but uh, the, the, the thriving jewel that is of a democratic government is because of the influence of Christianity. And that influence was tremendously uh, fostered after the Korean War with American military presence there. And it is such a uh, stark contrast of South Korea to just to the north, North Korea, the darkest land on earth and the most uh, uh, persecuting land, if that's a proper word, but the, the, the worst Christian persecution happens in North Korea and they've just extinguished the light of the gospel and they're paying the consequences of it. I want you to pray for the dictator of North Korea. His name is Kim Jong-un. He is the grandson of the founder of communist North Korea. But his great-great-grand, his great-grandfather was actually one of the first Koreans to come to Christ in the missionary movement of the late 1800s and early 1900s. So this man has a Christian legacy in his gene pool. And, uh, and we need to pray that that great grandfather praying in heaven and we praying down here, that there would be a breakthrough in this young man to set the captives free. Do I hear an amen? amen. All right, now let's get to the real part of the message, the apple of God's eye, Israel. And by the way, uh, it's awfully thirsty up here, Brother Matt. Can you just get a little cup of cold water for a, t a tired, weary soul? Uh, it says that in the scriptures that uh, uh, how refreshing is a cup of cold water for a, a thirsty soul as good news is from a faraway land. So I'm from a faraway land. I'm hoping to bring good news, but I do need that little bit of refreshment. 
Well done, good and humble servant. Don't we have a lieutenant to do this? Ah. Uh, and it's very interesting about Israel, modern Israel, that it was founded, of course, uh, legally founded on the 8th of May, 1948, as Israel, surrounded by enemies, declared their independence and formed the state of Israel. And immediately the United Nations convened to stop this. But Harry Truman, the President of the United States, despite all of the advice of his advisors not to do this, stood up and said, the United States recognizes the state of Israel. And again, Israel would not exist were it not at that very moment of its birth of modern Israel had not the United States with a bold president stood up and called it like it is. And over the years since then, various presidents have come and gone, uh, both some very pro-Israel, some not so pro uh, the current administration, this is not a paid political ad, but I must say they seem to have an excellent sight picture on the nation of Israel. And I bring this up now because remember God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. As for me and my house, we'd like to be on the blessing side. And I want to live in a land that blesses Israel. May we never turn our back against Israel because no nation on earth has prospered if they've turned their back or persecuted the children of Abraham. None whatsoever. And right now, I believe we are in God's, God's favor alone. There's a lot of times I agree with Billy Graham used to say, uh, God's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah on Judgment Day for what America is doing today. Now, he said that 20, 30 years ago. But I believe that the only reason that God's held back his judgment on our nation is because still there's a faithful remnant that love the gospel, and we have continued to bless the children of Abraham. But wait, there's more to Genesis 12:3. It continues after those blessings and curses. It says, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Well, you say, yeah, that's true. I, I'm a seminary graduate. This is because of Jesus and the gospel going to all peoples in the nation. This is true. That's the spiritual blessing, absolutely. But I want to remind you of the physical blessing that the children of Abraham have been through the centuries. Their creative genius has blessed all nations in the realm of art, music, philosophy, literature, finance, economics, medicine, science, chemistry, mathematics, engineering, politics, entertainment, just to name a few. They are the most gifted people on earth. And there's only 14 million Jews in the whole planet out of seven and a half billion people. You know what that comes out to? I have a math degree. I'll do the math for you. That's one-fifth of one percent of the world's population, and yet they've won over 30 percent of all the Nobel Prizes. Come on, folks. <laughs> Truly, they are the chosen people, the unique people chosen by God to bless the world. Now, getting back to the foundation stones of our nation, though, Remember, the founding fathers and mothers had, had no reservations. They were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Laura and I come from Boston, and we love to remind even Boston. And I learned this in grade school in Massachusetts, that the battle cry of the revolution was, no king but Jesus. That's from John Adams. Absol that is a historical fact that they don't like to teach anymore. But it is the absolute truth. You know the regiment that King George feared the most, the King of England? He called it the Black Robed Regiment because it was the pastors of the 13 colonies that were not only the internet of getting the word out, but the deacons trained the soldiers, the Minutemen. 
The church was involved right from the get. The, we're very fond as Bostonians of the Battle of Lexington Green. That was a church standing their ground, led by their pastor. Woo! Come on, Lord. But now let's go back to the epic words of the Declaration of Independence that we hold these truths that all men, and that includes you ladies, are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to achieve those goals, they wisely chose our motto to be, in God we trust. But the question is, you know, is our nation trusting in God today? Usually when the times get tough, we, we tend to get more trust in God. We're all humans, let's face it. But we need now, more than ever, to trust in our almighty creator. We need the, his guidance and wisdom. So where do we find the healing, the restoration for our nation? Remember, the enemy of our soul would like nothing better than to destroy this nation. Remember, Satan is always trying to bring the Antichrist on the scene. He always is. But yet, God always says, not so far. You can only go so far because the time is not yet. Why? Because the gospel hasn't come to all the nation, all the ethnic people groups getting close. But that is when Jesus said the end will come. But you know, there have been other dark times in our history. Some say maybe even worse than what we're going through today. But the beauty is that time and time again, God has intervened. Time and time again, when the people of God truly get on their knees on behalf of their nation, God has intervened. I recently learned from a pastor in Tulsa, that, and I did the math on this, and I, 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 I believe it to be true. America goes through a 50-year cycle of spiritual renewal. Now, hang on to fasten your seatbelts. We're going to have a little history lesson here. From 1720 to 1740 was the first great awakening with Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and others. And that was a revival through all of the 13 colonies that brought about a spiritual unity that gave them the endurance to run the race of the revolution. Uh, historians agree that without that great, the unifying force of that great awakening, they would have never, ever held together against the greatest military on the earth at that time. Then, from 1740, you had 50 years, it's 1790, the beginnings of the second great awakening. That awakening now was in the churches and in the advancing growth of the states. During that period, we formed 33 new states from 1790 to 1860. And it laid the, 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 the framework for our nation with schools, with hospitals, with uh, relief agencies, humanitarian agencies, and the abolitionist movement all coming from churches. Why do they call it the, the, the Baptist Hospital and the Methodist Hospital and the, the, the Catholic St. Francis Hospital? It's because churches founded those hospitals. Now, the enemy wants to steal and, and take them all over, as well as our universities and whatnot, but their origins were all from the people of God and a tremendous sense of Christian responsibilities of building this great nation. And of course, that took us to the, to the precipice of the Civil War. But I believe without that great awakening, the abolitionist movement would not have happened. We had to go through a horrible Civil War, but it set again the captives free and changed the soul of this nation. All right. 1860, we add 50 years, we get to about 1910. What's happening in Azusa Street? Woo! A revival is breaking out. From uh, 1910 to about 1914, and by the way, I, I shared that yesterday, but uh, we belong to a wonderful Assembly of God church in Tulsa, who is right now celebrating their 100th year. 
From, they were founded in 1919 by none other than boom, 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 motorcycle. Amy Simple McPherson came to town. They had a revival in Tulsa, and our little our church was born. And churches all over the world were born from that great movement of God in exploding what became the greatest century of the Holy Spirit ever worldwide, the work of the Holy Spirit in the 20th century. And that, uh, that I believe, was, was the anointing that took us through the dark times of World War I, World War II, uh, and to, to end global totalitarianism. So now from 1915, we add 50 years, and we get to 1965. What's happening now? There's a stirring of the spirit and the charismatic renewal. All of the anti-war movement's going on, but what comes out of that? The Jesus people movement. And how many churches across America draw their lineage from that fresh renewal to all of the mainline denominations and beyond? You realize that uh, out of the world, let me see if I get my math right here. Out of a world population of about seven billion people, there are four billion of those people that live in Christian preaching lands. Uh, they are hearing the, four billion people are hearing the gospel. About two billion of those people are born again evangelical type of people. And of that two billion, about one billion are spirit baptized, tongue speaking, praising uh, uh, brothers and sisters. I mean, it's amazing the work that has happened in this era. And I believe that renewal, you know, t it took us through Viet uh, ending the Vietnam War uh, and then uh, gave us uh, the culmination. I believe my military career was the collapse of communism of the Soviet Union without a shot being fired. That's a miracle. And by the way, just yesterday was the 30th anniversary of the Berlin Wall tumbling down yesterday. And yet happened, as I shared yesterday, because of the pastors in East Germany started preaching from their pulpits about freedom and the wickedness of communist enslavement, and the people rose up and the walls came tumbling down. That is the power of God. Okay, that's 1975. At 50 years, hello, we're down by 2025. Now, I am not preaching this as a prophet. I'm just preaching this as a student of church history. And I believe we're on the precipice of another great awakening. And oh, how we need it. But again, every one of those movements was preceded by a great prayer effort. And we are in a tremendous prayer movement. As uh, wicked and evil as this thing that I got in my pocket trying to hide is, okay, it does a lot of good too, you know. Uh, uh, and the communication of prayer through the internet, global prayer efforts, is phenomenal. I mean, the airways are melting. Uh, just. This morning, uh, Laura and I got up at uh, 6 o'clock. We, we're committed to pray for the nation and our state on the 10th of every month from, uh, uh, what is it, from 8 to 9. But we're here, so we had to do it from 6 to 7 this morning. But it's just a little piece of, of the, 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 the Holy Spirit has been raising up a unprecedented crescendo of prayer, and I really believe we, we are on the brink. That doesn't mean we just relax. We have got to be more vigilant than ever, because God's called us here in this nation for such a time as this. <laughs> right. If my people, that's us, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, not my hand, seek my face, face, yes, and turn, yes, there's still sin in the camp, turn from our wicked ways, then, God says, he will hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. So pray, pray, pray like your life depended upon it. We need to do that. So in closing again, as we just, 
have recognized the sacrificial efforts of our veterans. Uh, we point that all to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and our need to be in total surrender to his lordship. We're in the Lord's army. He's the commander in chief. Did you know that Jesus, never mind a four-star general, Jesus is a seven-star general. Well, where do I get that from? Well, in the first chapter of Revelation, he said, see, I hold in my hand seven stars. Uh, he's a seven-star general. He is the commander in chief. And we are all his troops. And uh, we have a divine commission from him. Never mind being a commissioned officer in the military. We are commissioned in the greatest military of all, the host of heaven, the armies of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the healing of our nation only begins <clears throat> with the healing of each one of us. So, as never before, let's remember today is the day of salvation. Just urge us all to just renew our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, to really make that declaration of dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. Even as we close this morning and Pastor Peter comes up and uh, really gives us that uh, a wonderful time of a closing praise and benediction, let's let the Lord really minister to us in what our calling is, uh, what our marching orders are in his heavenly army. Thanks again for letting an old warrior share some old war stories, but hopefully also some, some relevant points. Uh, remember, tomorrow is Veterans Day, so if you see a veteran, thank him or her for their service. They are well-deserved. Bless you, bless our veterans, and bless America.